Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my seventh ECG video blog. Our case for today relates to the diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia. How certain can you be that the wide complex tachycardia you see is VT? Once again, for your convenience, I've made a website that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. Above all is my email address. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. Today's case was sent to me by Dr. Saad Lari from Cape Town, South Africa. The patient was a 70-year-old woman who presented to the emergency department with chest pain. Her prior medical history was unknown. She was hemodynamically stable at the time this tracing was done. Questions. What is the rhythm? How certain are you of this diagnosis? As I blow up the last part of this tracing and add in these red arrows. And now show you where these arrows occur on the long lead to rhythm strip. And clinically, what would you do? Given that this 70 year old woman is having chest pain, but also given that she is hemodynamically stable at the time this fast rhythm was recorded. So here is another look at her 12 lead ECG and her simultaneously recorded long lead to rhythm strip. There are a number of important issues that are brought out by this case. First and foremost is the need to look at the patient first. This was done. The patient is having chest pain, but the good news is that she is hemodynamically stable. That said, the combination of chest pain plus the worrisome rhythm seen here means that prompt treatment is needed. The 70-year-old woman was immediately cardioverted in the emergency department. And immediate cardioversion successfully converted the rhythm to sinus, as you'll see in a moment when I show you her post-conversion tracing. The next issue to acknowledge is that you'll often need to begin treatment before you know for certain what the rhythm is. Not only is this okay, but it's good to expect that you won't always know for sure what the rhythm is at the time you need to begin treatment. Next, we need to acknowledge that in real life, several things will be done simultaneously. Case discussion and or reading about cases in books or articles often feels artificial because we can only read one thought at a time. But in real life, the seasoned clinician takes no more than a second or two to determine if a patient like this 70 year old woman is stable or not, while at the same time the brain is registering the predominant rhythm that this patient is in which in this case is a fairly regular wide complex tachycardia without normal P waves. The next concept to emphasize is that your initial preliminary rhythm analysis can and should be done in less than three seconds. With a potentially crashing patient in front of you, you may simply not have the luxury of any more time than this to arrive at the decision of whether or not to immediately cardiovert the patient. So while definitive rhythm diagnosis may take much longer, and this complex tracing had me contemplating my answer for a good 20 minutes, our goal is to comfortably arrive at a high clinical likelihood diagnosis of VT or not within no more than a few seconds. Finally, I like to emphasize that no matter how neat my carefully thought out explanations may sound on this video, sometimes you just got to be there. The printed word will never be a substitute for the instant impression experienced by the seasoned clinician on the scene. Our clinical reality is that if the patient is unstable because of the fast rhythm, then it doesn't matter if the Y tachycardia seen here is supraventricular or ventricular. This is because in either case, 
immediate synchronized cardioversion is indicated for the unstable patient in a fast rhythm, regardless of whether the rhythm is VT or SVT. So our rapid on-the-scene assessment of this patient and this rhythm told us to cardiovert before doing anything else, which was accomplished with success. Let's now delve into the step-by-step -step process of rhythm analysis for this initial tracing, with focus on the process and attention to key findings. As we'll see momentarily, there are clues that virtually guarantee within seconds that this rhythm is VT. How then to assess the rhythm? Our answer is in the same manner that we assess any rhythm. We use the P's, Q's, 3R approach. Are there P waves? Or at least is there evidence of atrial activity? Is the QRS complex wide or narrow? Which gives us an idea of whether the rhythm is supraventricular or not. And then we assess the three R's. Rate of the rhythm, whether the rhythm is regular, and if P waves are present, are these P waves related to the QRS? Let me emphasize that it doesn't matter in what sequence you consider these five parameters. And we often change the sequence we use depending on what is easiest to see for the rhythm at hand. The key is that you always look at all five parameters for every rhythm you encounter, as this is the only way not to forget important findings. So remember to watch your P's, Q's, and 3R's as a memory aid that reminds us of what to look for when assessing the rhythm. So having said this, the problem with this particular rhythm is that the arrhythmia in the long lead to rhythm strip is not regular. Instead, other stuff is happening, as suggested by the presence of P waves, red arrows. In addition, not all QRS complexes are wide, as can be seen within the green ovals, which leads me to another invaluable fundamental rule that I use routinely in complex rhythm analysis. This is that if there is more than one thing happening on a given tracing, start by looking for the underlying rhythm. Taken one step further, start with what you know and leave the other stuff that may be more difficult to figure out until later. It will often be much easier to figure out other stuff after you determine the underlying rhythm. So look first for the underlying rhythm. To illustrate this point, we'll focus on the last part of this long lead to rhythm strip. We'll call the beat within the green oval other stuff and we'll use the P's, Q's, 3R approach to determine the underlying rhythm. So there are seven beats of the underlying rhythm on this rhythm strip segment before a narrow beat is seen that appears to be sinus conducted, red arrow. Therefore, we'll focus on these seven beats to determine the underlying rhythm. The QRS complex for these seven beats is wide, that is clearly more than half a large box. The rhythm for this seven beat run is regular. The R to R interval is about two large boxes in duration. So the rate for the seven beat run is about 150 per minute. And sinus P waves are not seen. Therefore, our impression is that the seven beat run constitutes a run of a regular WCT for wide complex tachycardia. While we cannot completely rule out the possibility of a supraventricular rhythm with either aberrant conduction or pre-existing bundle branch block, one has to assume this is a seven-beat run of ventricular tachycardia until proven otherwise. Statistically, the odds in a 70-year-old woman with new onset chest pain that a regular wide rhythm without sinus P waves is VT approach 90% even before looking at the tracing for more clues. Let's now go back to the full length lead to rhythm strip. Here's the run of the wide complex tachycardia that occurs toward the end of the rhythm strip. We presumed this run to be VT with 90, but not quite 100% likelihood. 
we saw this narrow beat preceded by a P wave at the end of this run, red arrow. Note that another narrow beat with a sinus P wave before it precedes this run. Note also that another run of regular wide beats without sinus P waves is seen toward the beginning of this rhythm strip. Sandwiching each run that is occurring just before and just after each run is a narrow complex beat preceded by a sinus P wave. Putting this all together, there are two wide runs that look the same that we presume to be two runs of NSVT or non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Question, can we increase the likelihood beyond 90% that these two runs are indeed VT? The answer is yes. The key to this answer lies with assessment of QRS morphology and axis during the tachycardia, as we'll see on the next slide, and on this slide for the rhythm below by looking at the three narrow beats that we see on this tracing within the green ovals. So among the most helpful of clues for proving a ventricular etiology for a tachycardia is identifying a separate atrial rhythm that is unrelated to the wide beat rhythm. We call this AV dissociation. AV dissociation is usually not seen with ventricular tachycardia because the usual fast rate of VT hides the underlying atrial rhythm. But sometimes P waves may be seen to occur at various points during the wide complex rhythm. When they do, this virtually proves VT is present because you cannot have two atrial rhythms going on at the same time. And if one or more sinus P waves occur at just the right moment, then you may see a capture beat and or a fusion beat that convincingly proves the wide rhythm is ventricular. This is because neither fusion nor capture beats can occur if the wide rhythm is supraventricular. So even though most of the time you will not see either fusion or caption beats with fast VT, it is good to be aware of these diagnostic ECG signs because when you do see any of them, this virtually proves the wide rhythm is VT. With that as brief background, let's apply this information to the rhythm strip below. In addition to the three sinus P waves highlighted by the red arrows, doesn't this purple arrow look like a P wave? Support that it is a P wave is forthcoming from these notches in the two previous QRS complexes that march out perfectly. Realizing that we can't quite march out P waves through the entire rhythm strip, this last notch, highlighted by another purple arrow, also looks like a P wave. So there may, question mark, be AV dissociation. At the very least, there appear to be three capture beats as shown by these narrow QRS complexes within the green ovals that are each preceded by a sinus P wave. Finally, there appears to be at least one fusion beat as seen within the purple rectangle by a QRS complex that looks to be intermediate in width and shape between the narrow sinus beat that precedes it and the wide ventricular beat that follows. Therefore, I can now be 100% certain that the two runs of wide beats on this long lead to rhythm strip represent non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Beyond the core, there are multiple interesting aspects to this tracing, some of which are quite advanced. We simply want to highlight some of these more advanced points while emphasizing basic concepts along the way. The bottom line, of course, is to appreciate that VT must be assumed until proven otherwise. But did you notice when comparing the PR interval preceding each of the three capture beats within the green ovals that the PR interval preceding the middle capture beat is a little bit longer than it is for the other two capture beats? Why is this? This is not Wenckebach. Instead, it reflects what is known as concealed conduction, which simply means that we cannot explain this longer PR interval by what we see on the ECG, but rather must postulate the physiologic reason by events that we do not see on the surface ECG. 
Ventricular beats and or ventricular rhythms often conduct retrograde or backwards from the ventricles to the atria, at least in part. They may not conduct far enough back to produce a retrograde P wave, which would appear as a negative P wave in Li2, but they may conduct far enough back to slow down the speed of forward conduction of the next normally occurring sinus P wave. And when they do, you'll often recognize this by prolongation of the PR interval immediately following the ventricular beat within the red oval. Do not be concerned if you did not notice this. We simply want to make you aware that even though the PR interval preceding this middle capture beat is longer than the PR interval preceding the other capture beats, that this middle capture beat is still being conducted, which is helpful because the finding of true capture beats during a wide complex tachycardia proves that the rhythm is VT. Let's return to the 12 lead obtained during the tachycardia. As already emphasized, the finding of AV dissociation and capture beats has already proved that the underlying rhythm in this case is VT. But often with wide complex tachycardias, we won't be nearly so certain of rhythm etiology from a single lead monitoring strip. In such cases, assessment of QRS morphology and a frontal plane axis on the 12 lead during tachycardia may be invaluable clues to the etiology of the wide tachycardia. So let's focus on the 12 lead. While full discussion of QRS morphology during wide tachycardias is a topic unto itself, well beyond time limitations for this video blog, I'll make two points. The first deals with the frontal plane axis during the tachycardia, which is easily determined by looking at the QRS complex in lead 1 and in lead AVF. Extreme axis deviation during a wide tachycardia is highly suggestive of VT. By this I mean not just slight or moderate axis deviation, but the finding of an all-negative QRS in either lead 1 or lead AVF during a wide tachycardia almost always means we are dealing with VT. So if we look at lead 1, we can see that it is all-negative, which means there is extreme right axis deviation, which strongly supports our presumption that the rhythm is VT. My next point deals with QRS morphology, which we can rapidly assess by focusing in on QRS morphology in three leads, which are leads 1, V1, and V6. The concept is that a supraventricular etiology due either to pre-existing bundle branch block or barren conduction most often manifests a QRS morphology consistent with some form of conduction defect, either typical right or left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block with a hemi block. And the quick way to determine if typical right or left bundle branch block is present is by looking at the QRS in leads 1, V1, and V6. If QRS morphology in the three key leads is not typical for right or left bundle branch block, then VT becomes that much more likely. Turning to this case, lead V6 is consistent with typical right bundle branch block because the initial part of the QRS is positive and there is a wide terminal S wave as should be the case for typical right bundle branch block. But lead V1 does not manifest the typical RSR prime that we expect with typical right bundle branch block. And lead 1, which is all negative, looks nothing like either right or left bundle branch block. So while not 100% accurate, the atypical QRS morphology seen here further supports our presumption that the rhythm is VT. Let's finish this case by a review of the post-conversion tracing. Going back to the initial presentation of this case, the patient was a 70-year-old woman who presented to the emergency department with chest pain. This was her initial ECG with the long lead to rhythm strip below. 
Details of the patient's past medical history were unknown. She was hemodynamically stable at the time this tracing was done. As we've discussed in detail, the underlying rhythm was correctly diagnosed as ventricular tachycardia, and the patient was immediately cardioverted. This is her post-conversion tracing. Note that she is now in sinus rhythm, red arrow. Our purpose in showing the post-conversion 12-lead ECG is twofold. First, to confirm sinus rhythm, while at the same time confirming the etiology of the rhythm during the Y tachycardia. The second reason we always obtain a complete 12-lead ECG after conversion to sinus rhythm is to look for any potential findings of concern on the ECG after the rate has slowed down. Hint, does this post-conversion ECG provide any clues as to why this 70-year-old woman might have been having chest pain? So, in addition to sinus rhythm, there is a rightward axis, incomplete right bundle branch block, small infralateral Q waves, with the most remarkable finding being fairly deep and worrisome ST depression that is localized to leads V2 through V4, green arrows within the red rectangles, in association with the disproportionately tall R waves in leads V2, V3 in the 70-year-old woman with new onset chest pain, this picture suggests ongoing acute posterior infarction. The patient was cathed and found to have a dominant left circumflex artery that was acutely occluded, and that's why she had VTAC. Let's finish this case by showing how the post-conversion tracing can definitively prove that the white complex tachycardia was VTAC. As noted, the rhythm on this post-conversion tracing is sinus. So how do we use the post-conversion tracing for assessment of QRS morphology when telltale clues like capture beats and AV dissociation are not present? The answer is simply to compare lead by lead the QRS morphology that we saw during the wide tachycardia with QRS morphology after restoration of sinus rhythm. For example, let's look side by side at QRS morphology on the post-conversion sinus rhythm tracing with these inserts from leads 1, 2, and 3 taken from these same leads during the wide tachycardia. Note how different QRS morphology was during the wide tachycardia compared to now after conversion to sinus rhythm. In lead one, even though right axis deviation is present on the post-conversion tracing, there is an initial R wave, whereas during the wide tachycardia, there was no initial R wave at all. In lead two, there was a mono monophasic upright R wave with delay in the initial upslope, whereas with sinus rhythm, the initial deflection is oppositely directed in the form of a small initial Q wave. The same holds true in lead three. So not only does QRS morphology in these leads during the Y tachycardia not resemble any form of conduction defect, but it is also dramatically different than QRS morphology after restoration of sinus rhythm. Similar mark changes occur in leads V1, V2. While with sinus rhythm, there is an upright QRS complex in lead V1 due to the incomplete right bundle branch block, this looks very different than the amorphous taller right R wave peak that was followed by an S wave during VTAC. Similar mark change in QRS morphology between sinus rhythm and VT is seen in lead V2. Thus, even without capture beats and AV dissociation, we could have been virtually 100% certain from assessment of pre and post QRS morphology that the Y tachycardia in this case was VT. That's it for today. Hope you've enjoyed our case on diagnosing this interesting rhythm. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now.